presenters are going to be the very wonderful OWL project. Who uh, We have two out of three of them here. We have Anthony Hall and Steve Simons here, and Simon Blackmore is the, the third non-present member. Uh, they, they all have their own individual practices, but as OWL project, they've, they've worked for quite a number of years with uh, combining wood and electronics, combining handcraft with uh, modern technology which um, I think you've probably found that I'm quite interested in. Uh, and uh, their, latest, um, their latest project was a cultural Olympiad commission on the, uh, on the time, which they're going to talk about as part of their presentation. <coughs> I will say um, we don't often distribute questionnaires to our audiences. Uh, I can't stand filling them in myself. Um, but we have tonight because we think uh, there's a nice combination of people who come regularly to our events and to new people that we haven't seen before. And uh, you know, it's really nice for us to find out a little bit more about you um, and what you like and why you've come. So if you could spare a couple of minutes just to fill in the form, uh, we won't inflict it on you every time you come, I promise. And uh, are, are you guys ready for a Excellent. Good bit of noisy feedback. That's always the way to go. <laughs> All right, going to hand over to the wonderful Al project. You want to okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, we're, we're um, just going to tell you about uh, our work and I guess the like origins of the Al project and leading up to our latest project. Um, yeah, basically, uh, I guess when we when we started. In Manchester, uh, we were quite inspired by there's a sort of good underground electronic music culture, um, and also at the time there were just these uh, these massive posters of Apple Mac computers going up around the city. These are uh, huge building sized things, sort of very luscious imagery, um, and we also were quite into reading Wire magazine and the kind of electronic music that was there. I noticed all most you know, people were into were using these uh, Apple Macs to perform with, and there were lots of images of illuminated faces, the Apple Mac logo, it was, we, you know, it was everywhere really. We thought we really needed to question this ubiquitous technology as a, and, and it's used in sort of create, creating electronic music. Um, so we came up with this, um, the Log1K, which was our, our first musical instrument, I suppose. And um, the idea was that it was meant to emulate electronic music and also give the look of a computer but to be made from entirely sort of entirely DIY really so we went out to the local park and found some timber brought it back to our studio uh, although we had a background in sculpture we had never done any audio electronics so we we hacked out this log and kind of started experimenting with making electronic sounds uh, minimal electronic sounds so glitches and beats and uh, I guess the first thing we experimented with was this uh, noise you get when you touch your fingers on the on the wire of of a audio input and the effect of putting a battery onto a speaker directly. So the very first Log One K just had a, this very lo-fi technology to create very hard beats and electrical interference. And at the time, I guess we weren't really expecting to make anything that sounded like music. But the more we worked on it, the more interesting and sort of layers of sound we were getting um, and I guess it motivated us to start actually using these as musical instruments. Um, a lot of people thought they were kind of a hoax and, and uh, also we were kind of accused a lot of using laptops inside wood um, but we ended up doing quite a lot of gigs with these around, around Europe and stuff um, and they're quite heavy so we thought we really need to make a more portable lightweight one and so when iPods started being advertised, we, we really thought we needed to make a reaction to that to, to sort of continue the, the look. So, so we, um, this is us performing, um, we, it's really important to keep a very serious face and, you know, sort of emulate this image. It's, it's, this sort of image was as important as the log, I suppose. Um, the iLog was all of our, we basically packed as much technology into a handheld log as possible. And we've got some here, I don't know if you want to try no. um, demonstrating some of them. We developed, because we were basically learning about technology as it went, and every time we learned something new, we try and pack it into a log and use this as a, you know, and they're very, 
it was a perfect size, you know, the kind of semi-circular size fits in your hand, grips, back grips. Um, you know, there's lots of advantages over, over plastic. Um, make, you know, it just feels nice and looks nice. And it's available everywhere, really. So once again, I love photosynthesizer. It turns the light straight to sound. The light around you is uh, often fluctuating, where you think it's all steady, but when it's not, it's not at all. And um, some things sound nicer, some things sound nicer than others. Oh, yeah, two mics. Okay, so, we'll do it. Yeah, um, you want to demonstrate the Russell? Russell. Um, okay. The Russell was, um, is this actually on this one? Yeah. Um, the Russell has, was a real sort of iPod competitor because it, it recorded um, the, its big sort of, uh, I guess, USP was that it could record 20 seconds of sound. And this is a big deal for us. Um, when we started working with, with audio uh, samples and stuff like that and, that and building this up into kind of quite a lot of layers. Um, Have we got any volume on this one? They're quite hard to use. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they're all, the thing is they're all different so the play buttons are always in different places um, and we're quite into this idea of having quite limited interfaces to perform with. <laughs> oh I can't get to work now. Maybe we'll get it going afterwards. Yeah. We'll get it going up. Wrong button. <laughs> so it's right, sample so. sound. We'll get it going up. We'll get it going up. We'll get it going up. <laughs> we'll As performers, we find that putting a s performers, we find that putting a single action within one instrument really pushes us to try and make something interesting happen whilst live. Um, Simon in particular gets on with the Russell quite well. Um, although sometimes we do want to um, just make a bit of noise. And we have uh, sound generating. Sound generating things like this, the uh, ILOG signal. Where we use uh, a light sensor to modulate some kind of um, oscillator. <laughs> Enough of that. Excellent. So, um, through our website, we had a huge amount of people contacting us, wanting wanting iLogs uh, as an alternative to an iPod, I suppose. So we, the thing is, um, we could never really produce these uh, and make money from them because it, if you're lucky, you could perhaps make one in a day. Um, it would probably not work, and it, you know, it was very hard to sort of sell them at the price that people were actually willing to pay for it. So, um, confronted with this problem, we we, we started to. Um, think of the idea of making work, lo these logs as a workshop, I suppose, and actually getting people to make them with us um, and learn about how they work. So, uh, do you want to say something about the iLog? Uh, log, um, the uh, log, well, the, this is working. The, um, the log which we actually, we did have a couple of workshops. Uh, one of them is the M-Log or iLog data, which is actually a USB controller. And you've got the USB there, you can plug it in. Uh, Tony's going to demonstrate uh, one as, uh, as I talk. It's been like this one just has lots of sort of sensors to make strange random The interesting thing is we standardised We standardised it. Um, we standardised the rough size of the log and we um, cut a circuit board that we put inside. And then at the start of a workshop, the audience who are becoming collectors in effect, so making their own piece of artwork, are presented with a blank bit of wood with nicely polished, cut off there and hollowed out already for their log. 
but then they get they design the actual interface structures that they put on it based on how they think they might get uh, they might use this bit of wood in performance. So if they're um, if they play a flute or something, people tend to do put sensors along the side. Um, guitarists put it another way, or other people just think, oh, it looks nice to put my knobs and switches in those particular places. We also do another workshop where we make the um, ILO photosynthesizer, um, which is this one's here, which is a, um, uh, this is the latest version actually, which doesn't need a battery. It's uh, an idea of that it's charged by day, play by night. So you can put your lock outside in the daytime, and the solar cell will charge it up. And then when you're ready to go out and perform, you plug in your audio, turn the switch, and the light sensor, the solar cell then becomes a light sensor to turn straight to sound with your bike lights or whatever it is you want to uh, use to perform with. Uh, oh, it's more machinery. Uh, oh, and that's an example of uh, someone's uh, finished lock. Kind of uh, clunky, kind of chunky, kind of put in your pocket and <laughs> walk away kind of lock. We do actually, because it's got an accelerometer and stuff, we do actually have some software where you can control um, presentations. So you can stand there and go, oh, one slide, <laughs> next slide. Obviously, we're using it tonight, yeah, so it's obviously very reliable. <laughs> Talking about sound, yeah. um, we're doing a lot of performances with these handheld instruments and we're kind of a little bit fed up with people couldn't really see what we were doing and uh, wanted to branch out a bit into making more mechanical, larger things. So we, we started on this project called Soundglave in probably 2005 or something. And um, the idea of Soundglave was that you could, uh, it was a pole lathe which you pedal with this treadle and you had to you kind of pedal it in in rhythm and that the the pedaling tempo gets captured with a sensor and that, that can control sort of commercial music making software or we can use the sensors to detect the motion of you carving a piece of wood into into a shape and then that kind of gets transformed into sound using whatever whatever software you like. So we, we sometimes use Max MSP for example. Um, this is quite a difficult performance because you not only have to concentrate on keeping in rhythm with that and carving a sound, uh, carving a shape that sounded interesting. Uh, it's technically quite difficult to set up and quite physically quite exhausting to perform with, and it always got taken in quite different ways really because it's meant to be kind of quite a humorous thing, and we always ended up being taken quite seriously when we're doing it. So it's kind of kind of difficult um, project. So I guess from this, I, I mean, ultimate portable. Um, pre-industrial portable tool, we thought we needed to continue this theme and um, we started working with this guy Ed Carter who's a friend of ours who um, enjoyed our work I guess and he said we should make an application to the Cultural Olympiad for the Artists Take the Lead project um, he said you know why don't we make an artwork for the River Time that maybe generated its own electricity and sensed the water quality and maybe, you know, maybe made sound or something so we, we came up with this uh, this this uh, idea that we could perhaps make a, um, a water mill that used the energy of the river to generate electricity and actually float on the river. Um, so we started looking at pre-steam technologies, water wheels, milling, and came up with this idea of milling, milling data and um, looking at all these old mechanical devices. So. Um, yeah, well, it was interesting because we had to not only revisit these sort of lost skills, but also re-adapt them for making in a, a sort of with our digital technology. So we we generate these gears mathematically and cut them using a CNC machine, uh, and then fit them together by hand. Um, so they're very handcrafted. Uh, there's just to be to move along a little bit quicker. Oh yeah, um, okay. The um the thing about flow is that there's an element of craft in that. The wheel um, generates electricity, um, but also it's a musical instrument. And that left us with the problem that we had 12 volts to make a loud noise with, uh, and no PA. So we've developed our own PA system uh, based on these very efficient uh, cone shapes um, 
you can see how big they are, they're about one and a half to uh, plus meter horns. Uh, our biggest is uh, just over two meters long. And what they do is they amplify the sound very, very efficiently. So we have uh, a little 12 volt, well actually a run of a nine volt battery for a couple of weeks. And it will be kind of quite loud, be loud enough to do performance in here, uh, along with the sound layers of course. Make it even harder to move around. Uh, it was quite interesting making these. The, um, <laughs> what angle does the wood have to be cut at? We thought, oh yes, yeah, easy, you know. But no, it's not. <laughs> and we, we ended up having to write a computer program where we could, first of all, decide what frequency do we want. We need one set of tools to work out the frequency response of the speaker. <laughs> and that gave us some numbers to put into this other program that would tell us what angle to cut the wood at. And once we got that, it was uh, fine and easy. This is a lovely steam bent version, which is like kind of absolutely gorgeous, but like incredibly difficult to make. Where each of these panels was modelled in Blender, then cut out into uh, on a CNC and then steam bent into shape. Um, you'll see a video of Flow net uh, very shortly. Um, and that's a, that's what happens when you give a, a, let the give the, our, our project a bigger log to make it into an interface. That's a 12-channel analog synthesizer. It's a metre and a half long, uh, and it is jam-packed of uh, DIY electronics that um, Simon actually has designed and made himself. Oh, five minutes. Well, we'll chop down the video. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's me swearing at some electronics. Let's move on, because that was a very bad moment. Uh, about we, we so you'll see a video. This is an artist or well, the uh, architect, um, uh, uh, um, Nikki Kirk, is in drawing of the plans uh, based on discussion. And uh, there's a wheel, there's a shed, and very shortly you'll see a little bit more about it. <coughs> Flow's a tide mill, it's a floating mill house in Waterville floating on the River Tyne. It responds to the theme of harnessing natural energy, and we want to do something that was powered by the river, but that also represents the behaviour of the river and, and sonifies that in different ways, looking at the different changing environment of the river over the course of the tide. There's a natural cycle to the river in Newcastle, like I said, where as the tide comes in, water gets pulled up out of the river into the city, which then drains out again as the tide turns. Now we've found that this is beautifully illustrated by a water wheel which turns in both directions. There's a cycle in industry as the area that was originally very industrial then died out and now it's having a rebirth as more of a cultural centre. It's not a floating art gallery. The whole idea is that this is a floating instrument that lives and breathes and responds to the river and it's powered by the river. But the ultimate end result is the sonic composition. Mm, yes. That's the end, that's the sort of the purpose of the machine is to work together to make this sound environment. In the early stages of the, the project, we looked at a lot of different floating <coughs> structures and we came across the thing that this is a mill, um, a tide mill, and we kind of looked at a lot of different tide mills, ship mills is another name, and we started to build up a kind of collection of images of these sort of structures. Traditionally, a ship mill would be a floating mill that was used to mill uh, corn and grain into flour. So we've taken the idea of a mill and instead of milling flour, we're milling data which we're extracting from the water using our sensors and we're also extracting the energy and we're milling that data into different sounds and, and broadcasting it. It really, really resonated with the way our project worked to augment obsolete technologies and re-envision them in a, in a new and quirky, questioning way. From the very initial concept, we moved on and started developing ideas of how this could turn into something that we could actually present on the river. And in order to do that, we've had to draw in lots of partners, an architect, boat builder, water builder designer, and then we um, found a company called Amber Boat Company on the Northumberland coast and worked very closely with them in developing and designing and building the final piece. It's basically a catamaran structure. Um, 
the larger structure has a timber frame mill house on it. There's a, a, a void in the middle between the next to the other hull and um, in the middle is the uh, large diameter water wheel. It's quite an unusual yeah. project really. I mean, we've, uh, it's not often that uh, you get to build a floating house uh, with a water wheel uh, on it, so that's been very uh, unusual and very interesting as well. There's been different challenges on the building that I wouldn't generally face in my sort of normal day-to-day -day life of building structures on that. There's different things you have to think about in that interaction with the, the water and the, the marine structure has been quite an interesting aspect of the project. It's an ambitious project and perhaps the ambitious side of that comes from the aspect there's four different components that actually really need to tie together. That being it's a floating structure, it's going to sit on water and the public are allowed to kind of come on to, be able to come onto this thing. There's the building aspect of it as well, the mill house itself which is a tin frame building. There's also the wheel, which is something that's actually moving in the middle of these two holes, so that presents another problem. And so those things all combine alongside the artworks, which are housed internally, present quite a few different interfaces. Well, for me, it's a great opportunity to, you know, make something like this, uh, to complete the powertrain and uh, illustrate what can be done. You know, it's, um, as an education tool, it's fantastic. As an engineering exercise, you know, it shows what can be done with a bit of steel and timber. And historically, it represents what was commonplace about 100 years ago. It was a bit off the wall when we first saw the drones. And, uh, and to be honest, I thought, I didn't think it would ever come to life. But once we start to make progress on it, and then from the drones, it come to the, the, the box stages and the, the pontoon stages. And, I don't know, it's been one of those, one of those experiences that you know, like none of us will ever forget. We'll be talking about it in the years to come, for sure. It worked, baby. <laughs> I don't know who's more amazed. <laughs> <laughs> It was towed down the coastline, uh, and I think it took about 12 hours to, to bring it about 20 miles into position, and then it was towed inland up the river tide to where it, where it now rests, just by Gateshead Millennium Bridge, uh, and opposite Baltic Centre for Contemporary Art. The cylindrical sample sequencer takes hourly samples of the river. Each sample of the river is turned into sound by, uh, by the sequencer and it's specifically the saltiness of the sample that controls the note that the audience can play around with the experiment. The Tabinatron uses a series of gears to circulate water through a continuous sample which is in the form of a tube. There's a laser shining through the tube which scans the sample by goes up and down using this crank mechanism. As the laser goes through the water, it amplifies the sound of the tiny particles of mud that are flowing through the water. With the bubble sink, we've got these three huge bellows that pump air into demijohns full of time water. And you can you hear the sort of resonance of these, these jars of the water and they, they change. As the height of the water changes, you get different pictures in the demijohn and then people can use the interface to, to kind of tune that and to play about with that sound as well so you can listen to certain frequencies and really explore the sort of the resonance that these, these chambers have. Some of the sides of the instruments are quite awkward and you yeah. can't just play them around. So you, you know, someone else will come up and play alongside you or several other people. And also some of them are facing each other so you're engaged with the other person as you're, as you're playing. And so there's this collective musicality that comes out. It's a musical collaboration between the river and the natural river activity and that being sampled and demonstrated and the effect that the, the people who are interacting with the instruments have in terms of how they affect those instruments as they're responding to the river. So it kind of all feeds straight back to what the river's doing at any point in time. There's a sort of sense of time being captured and frozen and then being played out through these, these sound instruments. We wanted to have something where there are loads of different types of work going on on board that give people different ways of engaging with the project. So there's been commissions and screenings um, and lots of different work that's sort of been developed in response to the same themes that we work with with Flow.
terms of the legacy of Flow, we really want people to come down and see the wheel and the power source and come on board and see the instruments and hopefully enjoy what we've tried to create in terms of how the project sonifies the behaviour of the river. But beyond that, we really want people to come down and take the opportunity to enjoy being on the river and hopefully form their own opinions about the constantly changing environment of the waterway. see the wheel out of the water and the scale of it there was actually a point when we were considering making that wheel ourselves in our studio and we were seriously thinking it'd be possible for us to, to make that out of entirely wood and one of the compromises was we had to make it out of metal because it was much cheaper and much better to do that um, and also interesting working with these other people so David with the bubble hat who was the electrical engineer he was um, as much an artist as us really in his he was so obsessed about making low power drive trains that he was really excited about that. He actually made for the this he hand made this generator in a sort of biscuit tin kind of looking thing and all the coils were hand wound from hundreds of wine things to generate this electricity. And it's a lot of beautiful it's an artwork in itself as well as he considers it as an artwork himself. So, you know, that in itself was something really interesting. It's, um, it's fascinating to see you come out the other end of this project because uh... I saw you <laughs> a few months before, and uh, yeah, I think it was uh, it was a big, big, big thing to take on. 